Offside Broadcast, the best Vox casting either side of the breach. Here's your announcer, proven in numerous product tests to be the number one way to remove those pesky insurgent thoughts of rebellion from your subconscious. All of these tests were carried out by the lovely people at Smedley's Asylum on usually completely unwilling participants. So you know it works. Thank you, Dr. Stanley Grimwell, for providing the valuable public service that you do. You're listening to Tales of Malifaux on the Breachside Broadcast and... Although I'm sure you don't do this anyway, don't you go reaching for that dial in between the sections of our story this week. Oh no, do we have a treat for you. See, we know how hard it is to look after children in today's society, be they living, undead, or fish people. I'll be giving you information about some places you can take those kids if it's all getting too much. That's it, the very best children-friendly attractions in Malifaux. But... Not before we start our story this week. One for the youngsters, it is a great adventure. Are we sitting comfortably? Good. Then we may begin. A Great Adventure A is for awful. B is for blood. C is for creature, a thing that goes thud. All stories begin small, with a twist of fate. The teddy bear was a little dirty, a little frayed, and its black button eyes were a little loose. Someone had lovingly stitched and patched its fuzzy brown sides, however, and it was well stuffed with straw. It lay on the floor in a slick of blood, its long muzzle pointing straight up at the ceiling. The sitting room of the Grey family was low and cramped. A wood-burning stove stood in the corner, beside some brightly coloured number blocks, a toy cutlass, and a wooden train. A table, chairs, and various ornaments lay broken or flung on their sides, and the yellow curtains were torn. The room was even more cramped with all the men in it, talking in tight, low voices above the muscled sobs from the back room. Gilled badges hung from chests, beneath grim, vengeful expressions. The air was charged, like at a hanging. There was blood all over, but those present wanted more. A tall man entered, as rangy and grizzled as an old mountain lion, and the voices hushed. Riding spurs clinked as he walked, and guns hung from his belt. He did not take his hat off. He spoke to a hefty man with a sergeant's badge, in a wilderness drawl that was soft and gentlemanly, with just a hint of menace. Your man in back. You got a name? Gray, sir. Phineas Gray. Has he talked? The sergeant glanced toward the back room. Some of the men had a go at him. Didn't say nothing worth repeating, sir. The neighbors. They hear anything? If they did, they ain't talking. Even behind his bushy gray mustache, the man's expression told what he thought of the neighbors. They're scared, sir, the sergeant said. This was his neighborhood and he felt an odd compulsion to rise to its defense. Proper scared. Been a lot of sightings, odd things. Then this. The man looked at the sergeant for a while, his eyes hidden under his hat. Y'all know this part of town. Seen many street kids hereabouts? The wee Malkies, the little sisters, Krooligans? Not now you mention it, sir, no. Is that important? The man considered this for a long moment, then gestured to the back room. Fetch our Mr. Phineas Gray to the cells. Mind he doesn't fall down any stairs on the way there. 
He looked around. The victim? Well, just. The sergeant pointed over by the teddy bear. And then at various other red, wet splashes around the room. The man with the spurs took a last look and left. Bleeding Neverborn hunters thinking they're better than us, Sergeant Kliegerman muttered as he headed for the murderer in the back room. So you got nothing to do with him anyways. Not long after. The sun came up and all the men departed, leaving a bruised, brooding emptiness in the house. Shadows came and went and came again as day passed and night fell. Flies clustered around the darkening blood in the silent rooms and crawled on the teddy bear's fur. But the house stayed still and dead. And so things might have remained. If fate had not lent a hand, the house would have been cleaned and stripped and the teddy bear thrown away along with everything else. Things might have turned out very differently. Had the rat not come along. Drawn by the blood-soaked straw, the rat gnawed a hungry hole in the toy's side before picking it up in her jaws and running back down into the sewers with her treat. The sewers of Malifaux are home to things much worse than rats. And the sight of something raw and bloated eating an unwilling supper frightened the rat into dropping the bear into the foul water. It floated for a long time, passing through unlit halls and old buried streets, until a woman's hand closed over it and lifted it clear. <sighs> the woman whispered, in a voice like twigs on a window pane. You're perfect. You've seen things. Fingers more like knives gently stroked its button eyes. These remember. They do. Crooning softly over the sodden bear, the widow skittered up a long flight of steps, through a trapdoor, and into the back of a long closed shop. An old spinning wheel and a stool sat surrounded by a carpet of white bones. She cleared a space for the bear on the rotted floorboards by the wheel, sliced a seam open with one of her sharp fingers, and lowered her black bulk onto the stool, folding her many legs underneath. She opened her mouth, which was round and full of needles, and exhaled an inky, dark cloud that she captured on the wheel and began to spin into a glistening black thread. She placed the end of the thread into the seam she'd opened and continued to spin. She was happy in her work. It had taken her a long time to gather all the precious material she needed for the black thread. Many nights of clinging around eaves and windows, sniffing for the scent of a human child having a nightmare. There were quite a lot of those in Malifaux. Her whispers in their ears would make the nightmares worse. And then she could open her round mouth filled with needles, open it wide, lean close and breathe deeply of their fear. It was sweetness to her. The black thread began to fill the bear, and her sharp fingers worked fast, loosening the stitches and letting the sodden fabric stretch. It grew larger and larger, impossibly so. Still the widow exhaled the stolen terrors and the black thread ran on and on. Eventually the widow sighed and sat back, aching and weary, but pleased with her night's effort. The floorboards creaked, and dust fell from the cracked ceiling as the teddy bear sat up, its massive bulk filling the room. The fur was torn here and there, but instead of straw, what poked out looked more like bones and gristle. The button eyes had sunk into the fabric and vanished, leaving stark black holes like abandoned wells where something ancient and hungry waited at the bottom. The soft round hand split as black shards of bone pushed out to form wicked claws, and the stitched mouth opened to reveal a nightmare smile of swords. The widow clapped in delight. Teddy was in a toy room, bright and full of joy. He saw the woman clapping, and he smiled and clapped too. She must be a mummy. They were always kind and smiling. She was pleased with him, and he liked that. 
He played with the toys while the mummy watched. After a while, his tummy got sore and rumbled. He cried and tried to eat the toys, but they were dry and crumbled to dust. The mummy opened a door. At first, he was a bit worried, but the mummy told him that outside was a magic kingdom, and he was going to have a great adventure. Teddy liked adventures and waved goodbye to the mummy. The widow watched as the great creature lumbered off. Wrecking a path through the deserted woolen shop and out into the empty lane beyond. She wiped a tear away from one of her many bulbous white eyes. It was so hard to let them go. D is for doomed, sentenced to die. E is for endless, death to defy. Each minute in the cells lasted forever. But the days and weeks were stolen away as the appointed date drew nearer. The condemned man's shouts and yells were louder and fiercer than any of the others, but the jailers were deaf to cries of injustice. Even so, they were glad when Phineas Gray left. He had arrived pale and shrinking, but the darkness of the jail had brewed something black in his soul. Some said it was his crime eating him up. Others were not so sure. In his last days, those who met his hollow gaze under the lanky brown curls chose to sleep that night with a burning candle. The murderer was hanged for the crowd on a Friday. With his last words, Phineas Gray promised them all justice, in this life or the next. On Saturday and Sunday, a cold rain fell as his body creaked on the hanging tree in a breeze that few could feel, and those who could chose not to speak of it. On Monday, the body was gone. F is for fun, toy trains in a station. G is for grizzly, a nightmare creation. Not all mummies were kind. Teddy had learned this firsthand several weeks into his great adventure. To his delight, he had found a toy train set just like the one he remembered. The night porters of Creepwood Station had run screaming as the giant's never-born creature appeared out of the mists on the gas-lit platform. And had played with the brightly coloured trains for a while, rolling them up and down the track, while the happy faces puffed steam and smoke. The accountant dragged his elderly mother from the mangled wreckage of the sleeper car, amid the screams of the dying, while the abomination hurled another carriage at them along the tracks. And then he played hide-and-seek with the people inside. Rebecca knew she had to stop her brother's teeth from chattering, or the thing would find them both hidden away in the luggage compartment, so she wrung his neck. It still found her. Until they all fell asleep. But then a mummy turned up, with hair as black as coal under a cowboy hat. Teddy had run to play with her, but the mummy did not want to play. This was an angry mummy, with angry friends. Pistols cracked and made Teddy hurt. The black thread inside him tried to stitch his blood-soaked fur, but the onslaught of lead was more than even it could keep up with. Frightened and confused, Teddy turned and ran. He blundered through dark alleyways and down twist-back streets and hidden closes until all sounds of the angry mummy and her bullies had gone. By the time he reached an expanse of waste ground, where the moonlit mist lay like a patchwork quilt, he had quite forgotten about her and was keen to continue his great adventure. He set off, the mist billowing around him like a ship's wake. He passed a brightly painted wooden wagon, decorated with puppets, pirates and clowns, with coloured bunting strung up on old washing lines but no one was home. He sniffed the air and could smell no one to play with, so he carried on sailing through the magic mist to the kingdom of adventure, while far above Master Moon and Mistress Luna smiled down and whispered secrets only brave teddies should know. All was still and silent in the waste ground, until that was, something the size and shape of a small boy appeared, following Teddy through the mist its limbs clicking as it walked. H is for hired, a gun that is peerless. 
I is for injured, but nonetheless fearless. The woman sank slowly to her knees. Pain etched on her face as blood ran from the wound in her side. Her broken swords lay on the corpses in front of her, her empty pistols on the corpses behind. Give it up, bitch, Scissors O'Doul sneered, stepping back and wiping her blood off his knife. Loudon and Smalls, his two remaining companions, gave a nervous laugh. Lord knows I don't mind hitting women. I try and avoid killing them, especially the pretty ones. The woman said nothing, her head bowed her face hidden behind long red hair. It's Oriental Joe we want, O'Doul said. He was pointing with his knife at the man from the Three Kingdoms standing behind her. But O'Doul didn't move any closer. He had seen what the woman could do. The evidence lay cooling around her. Step aside and we'll match what he's paying you. With gritted teeth, the woman slowly drew a long stiletto blade hidden in her belt and dug the point into the cobbles to steady herself. She paused to draw breath, and O'Doul seized the moment. Springing forward, he kicked the blade away and then jumped back, a more bullish sneer on his face. That's what you call a last warning. The woman looked over her shoulder at her employer. Bye, Jian. Her dark eyes pinned him to the iron gate he stood against. His meaty jowls trembled and sweat stained his collar. He held up a hand, spreading all five fingers. The woman shook her head. Baijian glanced at O'Doul and his men, let out a whimper of fear, and held up both hands. Ten fingers. The woman looked away. Her hand breached into her boot and came out holding a nail file. She dug the point into the cobbles to steady herself. O'Doul started to laugh, but then she looked up at him and his laughter faded away into the night. His face hardened, and the knife came up. Loudon and Smalls hefted their brickbats and charged, yelling. Bajihan hid his face in his hands and curled up in a small ball until the sounds of violence were over, and the only scream was the night wind in the chimney tops. A rough hand grabbed his collar and pulled him to his feet. He looked not into the leering face of Scissors O'Doul, but the warlike face of the woman he'd retained to protect him. A woman he knew only as Zephyr. Eyes like gunmetal, and a countenance just as cold and hard. She wiped the nail file on the sleeve of her shirt and tucked it away. She held out a hand. The deal was for ten hundred. Stunned. Baijian handed over a neatly folded bundle of high-value guild scrip. He could not take his eyes off O'Doul. The man was still standing, his body shaking violently. How could he still be standing? Ten extra. He paid, transfixed by O'Doul. Expenses, Zephyr said, swaying on her feet, her voice cramped from the pain. Broke my swords. That'll be another two. Jian paid. And amount of ammunition. Another two. Call it two fifty. To Jian's enormous relief, O'Doul's body finally toppled, crumbling next to its own head. The blood spurting from the stump slowed to a steady ooze. Jian paid again without complaint. As she stepped away over the pile of bodies, he called out to her. That small fortune you have, you can do anything you want with it. No, sir, Zephyr said, stooping to pick up her pistols. It's not nearly enough. And she walked away, Odul's blood tattooed on her cheeks. J is for joke, a trick that is cruel. K is for kids who should be in school. The lane behind the rows of terraced brick houses was dark cluttered with rubbish and shadows. Old bed frames leaned against piles of moss-covered slates, and ash bins overflowed beside reeking night pails. The cobbles were dangerously uneven, and in places sinkholes stank of the sewers below. The lane was home to rats, cats, and other two-legged vermin. Hey, messes! Kalu shouted, 
flinging another cracked tile to shatter a window of the house he and his brother had targeted for that night's fun. What'll you do when the wee Malkies come? Hey, missus, what'll you do? Lights flipped on and Kalu snorted, ducking down behind the wall, crouching on a mouldy mound of broken boxes. He was almost invisible in his filthy rags, and his skin was dark with dirt and ash. He turned to elbow his younger brother into action. The plan was to draw the housekeeper's attention out the back, and then his brother would nip round the front and nick the brass off their door, leaving the traditional wee Malky calling card steaming on their front step. But Calais wasn't there. All of a sudden, Kalu felt a shiver run down his back. And he remembered what the older Malkies had said about going into this part of town. Boys and girls going missing. They didn't sound so stupid now. Then a pathetic mewling noise made him peer down the lane. And there was Calais. His tiny frame almost buried under a sack. A sack that was moving. What you got there? Kalu hissed, leaping down, all thoughts of warnings and number 78B's brass door ornaments flown at the sight of the bag. Show us! Kalei's face mirrored his brother's, a mischievous smile and a dirt-smeared face surrounded by long, filthy hair that might have been any colour once upon a time. Both of them wore the black rag of the wee Malkies around their necks. I've only gone and found a sack of kittens, didn't I? he whispered, eager to impress. I reckon a few are dead, you know, but I figure we can fling the rest wherever poor Egypt they lock up in the stocks in the morning. Then a sound that did not belong in the lane made them both freeze. It sounded like someone dropping canes onto the cobbles, over and over, and it was getting closer. What's that, Kalu? His younger brother backed off, the whites of his eyes bright in the darkness. What's that? Get it, Kalu hissed. Hide! As his brother heaved the sack into a garden, Kalu ducked behind some rusted old pipes. Kalei joined him in a flash, wedging in tight against his older brother. I don't like it. Put a sock in it. Kalu put his hand over his brother's mouth as the sound grew louder. Trembling, he put his eye up to a rust hole. It was hard to make anything out in the dark, but what he could see was small like him, and fast, but moving all wrong. And there were a lot of them. He caught glimpses of coloured cloth and enamelled eyes. There was no sound but the soft clatter of wood on the cobbled lane, and he knew that if they spotted him or Calais it was all over. Whatever they were, they were hunting. Kalu kept his hand where it was long after they had gone, until Kalei's tears had dried in the cold night air. Even when he and his brother crawled out, sprinted down the lane and ran breathless back to Wee Malky's territory, he was convinced he could hear the tap-tap-tapping behind him all the way. L is for Lady, gets quite a fright. M is for Master, won't outlive the night. Teddy liked the house. The yellow curtains reminded him of somewhere he once knew, and it had bright marble columns in the front, like teeth. It smiled at him, so he went in. The LaGrange family, grain merchants with solid guild connections, returned later that night from the opera. None of the servants were around. Everard LaGrange called angrily at the back stair and rang the bell, but no one appeared. Alarmed, he took his children to the drawing room to get his gun. Teddy had found several people in the smiling house, but none of them wanted to play. So he had to put most of them in the naughty box to teach them manners. Lady Isabel Lagrange entered the kitchen, and her look of fury turned to one of horror as she saw the blood slick on the tiled floor. A thick pool of it led back to the cast iron oven in the range. The door had been forced shut, and the parts of the servants' bodies that had not fitted fully inside were crushed around the edges. Hands, feet, and pieces she could not identify. There was always a low fire burning through the night, and the stench of cooked flesh turned her stomach. Then she heard her children screaming. But he had kept a few of them with him, 
to help him make number blocks. Teddy had always enjoyed number blocks, but it had been very hard to get these ones square. They were a bit mushy. The maids had fainted on the drawing room floor when the nightmare creature had plucked the butler's head clean off and started hammering it against the walls, forming it into a crude cube of mashed bone and brain. It had carved what looked like numbers into the sides with one jagged claw before reaching for the maids. But red was a good colour, and he hoped the family who lived here would like them. They did not. Disappointed, Teddy showed them how to make more number blocks, but when he had finished, there was no one left to play with. Outside the drawing room window, something small watched him play. N is the night watch to guard against danger. O is for outlook to watch for the stranger. One of the clock and all's well, Sergeant Kliegerman called feeling the rain trickle down the back of his neck. It sodding well was not all well, but every time he called out, as his deep voice echoed back to him in the narrow streets, he felt as if he had company on his patrol. A welcome feeling on a night like this. It had not been a good spell for the guild guard, he reflected, as he paced down Amberger Street the light from his lamp sweeping to and fro between the closed shops on either side of him. The cut glass of the windows flashed white as his lamp played over them. His cap was pulled low and his collar raised against the incessant drizzle. There had been that unfortunate incident of the murderer going missing off the hanging tree two months ago. They never had found the victim's body, of course, but the blood in the grey house had been enough for a conviction. Fortunately, that had been pushed off the front pages by the massacre at Creepwood Station. It had been released to the Malifaux Daily Record as a points failure on the track. No survivors meant no one to contradict the official version. A few more runaway kids than usual had been reported, but then the Lagrange killings, right in the heart of upmarket Feverstone Quadrant only a couple of weeks ago, had forced the Guild to put more feet on the beat in the areas around there. Specifically, his feet for the use of which he was unlikely to get overtime pay. Being a sergeant was supposed to spare him this nonsense, but here he was. The only saving grace was that the gangs of street kids had been unusually quiet recently, but all that meant was that the guild would have a hard time pinning trouble on their frequent fights. And then, although Sergeant Kliegerman was not keen on thinking about this alone at night, there had been the deaths of more than a few guild guard officers. No one was calling them murders, because the morgue had set heart attack in every case. Still, Sergeant Kliegerman could not remember the last time a heart attack had caused a man to rip his own ears off as he died. He shone the lamp beam over a patch of red brick wall next to Ormiston's butcher shop, where hand-printed bills curled in the rain. Missing children were buried under rugs for sale and snake oil sleep remedies were partially obscured by brightly coloured posters for the puppet show out on the waste ground. He walked on, swinging his lamp from side to side, the light flashing in the leaded shop windows. And then he caught a glimpse of his own reflection in one of the windows, and his thoughts fled, leaving only one remaining. There is someone standing behind me. Sergeant Kliegerman whirled, his pistol raised. The street was empty. He stood for a long moment, watching and listening. He had been guard long enough to know that some shadow should be jumped at. But the street held only him and the rain. The night air felt much colder now. He let out his breath and it fogged around him. A whiff of decay made his stomach rise. He glanced back at the window, and his heart shriveled in his chest. There it was again, closer this time. A dark figure, the rain glistening on its bowed head. There was something wrong with its neck. He spun back, crying out. But the emptiness of the street seemed to mock his fright. The rain grew heavier, hissing on the cobbled street 
summoning a knee-high spray. He looked back at the window, his pistol hand shaking. The figure was still there, only a few feet away from him. He could almost reach out and touch it. Then all sense left Sergeant Kliegerman as he realized its feet did not touch the ground. He screamed, dropped the lamp, and ran. He ran as if in a nightmare, the shops on either side hemming him in, the hiss of the rain drowning out the slap of his boots on the stones and the rasp of his breathing. In momentary pictures, each shop window he raced past contained only him and the thing at his heels, both blurred by the rain. In every reflected instant it drifted closer and closer no matter how fast he ran. A voice spoke, or it may have been just the hissing of the rain. Justice. Sergeant Kliegerman stumbled, cried out, and fell hard, skidding on the cobbles. His gun skipped away like a stone on a pond, lost in the dark. The street behind him was empty, but in the tall, rain-streaked window of a tailor's shop, the dark figure floated slowly closer. The rain hissed louder still, and it was all he could hear. Not even the drumming of his heart rose above it, and in the sound of the rain came the voice again. Justin, 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 Justin. The word was everywhere, carried on every drop of rain, in every bouquet of spray repeated over and over by a countless choir. Kliegman cried out, gripping his head, but nothing could keep the voices out. In the tailor's window, the figure stooped over him. A rope hung from its broken neck, and long curly hair hung heavy in the rain. Eyes burned with the fires of damnation. I know you, Kliegerman gasped, but he could not even hear his own voice any longer. It, it can't be. Justice, justice, justice. The rain hissed, and Phineas Gray bent low over Kliegerman and whispered secrets to him with his dead white lips and black swollen tongue. The morgue reported it as just another heart attack, although the guard surgeon chose not to comment on why the late sergeant might have torn off his own ears. Taking a break from a great adventure for some great places to take the youngsters in Malifaux. Often one of the first sights people coming into the city will see, the Hanging Tree is one of our city's enduring landmarks. Believed to have dated back to a time prior to the reopening of the breach, there is more to the Hanging Tree than its residents. If you look closely, you can see inscriptions upon the bark and swirling patterns. What they say? Nobody is sure, but don't look too close. You don't want to join Jackie Jackie Jackdaw on the tree, do you? Do you? Here's a fun activity. Why not play a game with your friends to figure out what corpse has been hanging up there the longest? There is absolutely no prize up for grabs at all. History not your thing? No problem. We have you covered, parents. Why not try tracking down the battered but brightly painted caravan that travels throughout the city? The one that always seems just out of your eye line when it moves. The one that is accompanied by the clatter of little wooden feet. We don't have a name for this mysterious purveyor of the musical arts. What we do know is that he puts on one hell of a puppet show. If you're lucky, you could even become part of the show. Forever! For show times, look where you least expect it. If the children aren't already clawing at the door to enjoy the great outdoors, wrangle them back for the finale to a great adventure.
is for plunder, winnings ill-gotten. Q is for quarrel, needlessly brought on. Just give me my share and I'll be on my way, the woman said, indicating the paired leather saddlebag stuffed with the stolen guild script. Denver noticed that she protected her right side and wondered if she had an old injury there. It certainly hadn't slowed her up on the job, however, and the way she dispatched those Union enforcers had been cool, clinical, and impressive. Now she looked pale and exhausted, just like the other four survivors of the raid on the Galestone Mine salary wagon, gathered in the abandoned trapper's hut. Josiah Denver had a mean, narrow face, with a tight mouth and a head that seemed to come to a point under the slicked black hair. Everyone but his mother thought he maybe had some bayou blood in him, and even some days she wasn't sure. No matter his expression, there was a sly hint of gremlin in those sideways eyes. He looked around at his hired hands, and wondered if he really wanted to share the proceeds with them at all. He held up a man to the woman he knew only as Zephyr. In good time. He looked over at Roke. He had taken a mess of pellets to the face and was in a bad way. Roke, it ain't right what done happened to you, but don't you think y'all should have been watching that third wagon? Roke didn't look up. His voice was pained and slurred. That was Jan's job. Denver nodded, glancing very briefly at Jan as the thick-necked Swede bridled at the tarnishing of his name. Maybe it was, maybe it weren't, Denver said. But he told me he had to go help Ferris with the locks. Now it was Ferris' turn to stir, and he fixed Jan with a cold stare. Didn't need no help. Didn't ask for none. The woman buttoned up her docker's coat and said in a low voice that only Denver could hear, It doesn't have to go down this way. Denver just grinned. Sharing was for deadbeats and children. Easy, Ferris. Sounds like you're calling Jan a liar. Had there been anyone outside the trapper's hut a moment or so later, they would have heard gunshots, maybe a half dozen or so, the flashes creeping through the cracks in the shuttered windows. They would have seen a man with shiny black hair come out of the door, saddlebag slung over his shoulder and a pistol in hand. They would have seen him take a few paces, drop the pistol, and then fall dead. And they would have seen a woman walk from the hut, pick up the saddlebags, and head off down the trail toward the horses. It was a lot of money Zephyr knew, but it wasn't yet enough. R is for run, a thing you should do. S is for scared, of things you bump into. It was too late to get away. The lawman towered over Kalu and his brother. He had a face like the mountain lions outside the Malifaux Museum, and riding spurs that clinked as he walked. Guns hung from his belt catching the light of the gas lamps behind him. About time I ran into you, he said in a prairie drawl. You and yours been keeping mighty quiet these past months. I reckon you're going to tell me what I want to know. Kalu puffed his chest out, but made sure his little brother was standing between him and the lawman. I'm not telling you nothing, bandy legs. We Malkies didn't clipe. Isn't that so, Kalu? The man looked at the older child for a while his eyes dark under his hat. Ain't half the words coming out your mouth mean a dang thing to me, boy. Speak English or I'll tan your hide. There's things in these streets at night got y'all running scared. I thought I had them too, not a few moments ago. Posse of them. But they up and gave me the slip. He smiled, but it was full of menace, and grabbed the knotted rag about Kalu's neck, twisting it tight in his big gloved fist. Then I got lucky and found myself a pair of jokers. Tap, tap. Kalu froze. But the big lawman mistook the fear in his face and carried on talking. Tap, tap, tap. Kalu couldn't see anything of the street past the man's enormous frame. Mister, he began. And then the lawman stopped mid-sentence, his mouth open. Kalu tried to pull away, but the lawman was holding him tight. Mister, the man started to shake. A stick with a sharpened tip appeared inside his open mouth, 
and slowly pushed out between his teeth. Blood poured down the man's chin, and his eyes rolled back into his head. His body jerked violently. Kalu's little brother screamed and tried to run, but Kalu was still holding him and the lawman holding Kalu. Then the stick vanished with a sickening slurp, and the lawman dropped like a stone. There was not one, but a dozen of the things crowding the narrow street. They were clad in garish colours, stripes and checks, some in just as motley, and one in the tricorn hat and black garb of a privateer. All had limbs and faces of wood, and they leapt on the body and hacked at it with their tiny, sharp fingers. Kalu drew a broken glass shiv and stabbed at the glove hand that still held him tight, and then froze as the marionette with the pirate costume raised its carved, painted face toward him and his brother. Its fixed smile and blood-covered hands were the last things Kalu saw. T is for torment, secrets to tell. U is for undying, dry whispers from hell. Phineas Gray was dead. He had died on the hanging tree three months ago or more. All that was left was his fly-blown body, warmed only by the fires of vengeance. He could barely remember anything of his life, and even his existence now passed by in splinters of awareness, drifting through an endless night. Dark fragments of the man he had been, held together by pain and anger. His was the pain of the noose around his neck, the pain that a man feels when all hope is truly gone, a pain that not even death had eased. The noose tugged at him, and he went. To officers of the Guild Guard who had been in the Grey House that night had pulled him, one by one. The whispers he had heard hanging on the tree blew through his dry, cracked lips, caressing them with corpse breath. He did not know who they were, or why he spoke to them, only that he must. The noose tugged, the fires burned, and he must. He spoke to the men who had walked him to the tree. He spoke to the men who had locked doors and turned keys until none were left who had wronged him. But still, it tugged. He came to an alehouse, tumbled down and rank with dead dreams, and he spoke to the men. None of them had been there that night, but his vengeance still burned all it touched, and he moved on. The fragments of Phineas Gray wept in their cold, dead prison. Time passed, or none at all. It mattered not. He came to a ward where the sick lay. The soft, dry whispers beyond the grave touched them all, taking everything they had but leaving him only anger and pain. He came to a house. All within heard his tales, from young to old, but it mattered not. The noose tugged, and he must. One cold night he passed a caravan on some waste ground. It was brightly coloured and beautiful to look at, but there was nothing alive within to whisper his secrets to, and he carried on past. His shriveled, putrid eyes saw a small figure hastening away as the clouds hid the moon. The noose tugged in a different direction, but whatever was left of Phineas Gray recognised something in that small running figure, and he drifted after it. V is for valuable, things we hold dear. W is for a wish, heart's desire sincere. Alderman Absinthe awoke to see a pistol and a face he knew. His mouth was dry from sleep, and his teeth were in a glass jar beside his bed, so it took a few attempts to get the name out. Shaffer? It was a question and a curse. Alderman Synth. Zephyr replied, with a small nod. Her red hair was tied back under a black scarf. She had a fresh scar on her right cheek, but she was as beautiful as ever. She put the candlestick down by Absinthe's bedside and gestured with a pistol at the glass jar. Good evening. Carefully, Absinthe plucked his teeth out of the jar and put them in his mouth, working his jaw a few times as they clicked into place. The movement let him shift the bed covers enough that he managed to slip his right arm back under them. 
The mercenary he'd hired at great expense two weeks ago did not seem to notice. The Lorimer brothers? Her eyes never left his, and the gun did not waver. Dead. For a moment he felt a surge of vicious pleasure, and then swallowed. I am surprised. I assumed they'd offered you double to kill me. They did. I see. But you killed them anyway. I never walk away from a paying job, and I always take payment up front. You knew my terms when you hired me. I suppose that once in your life you might consider making an exception? Absinthe's right hand moved very carefully and very slowly, closing over the grip of the custom snub-nosed peacekeeper he kept in a hollow in his mattress. Double it again? I know you're desperate for the money. Let me live. The Lorimers are dead. No one will ever know. Just walk away and let me live. Zephyr lowered her gun to her side, and for a moment his heart leapt. But then she spoke. I can't do that. The money's no object, damn it! He covered the sound of the hammer clicking back with his raised voice. Ten times what they paid you! No. I mean, you're already dead, Zephyr said, at the same time as Abster's finger tightened on the hair trigger and a hollow click sounded, muffled by the bedclothes. Zephyr tapped the glass jar with the tip of her pistol, and it rang softly. Powdered by you, Rose, apply to your false teeth. It's painless and quick. And I took the firing pin out of your gun. Abster tried to pull the trigger again, but his hand seemed numb and distant. Curse you, woman, he rasped. He fell back onto sheets that were suddenly damp with sweat. I hope you choke on your damn money. His breath was becoming heavier, and the candles seemed to be dimming. But he still had riches and enemies he did not want gloating at his funeral. There's a list, he said. In the drawer by the window. On the left, a list. And there's a safe in the room. I can pay you now. Get the list. Zephyr shook her head. You're a spiteful old man when all's said and done. But with the script from the Lorimers, I finally have all I need. Your sons will have to continue your petty feuds for you. All you need? Abster gasped. I'm offering you a fortune. Whoever has all they need. Zephyr's face grew terrible, and Abster shrank further into the bed. I did once. Then a man murdered my son, Dylan. Dylan Gray. Maybe you've heard of him. He could barely see her any more. And no matter how deep his breaths, his lungs barely filled. That was last year. They hanged him. On a tree. Phineas Gray. I remember. He was... Your husband? Her voice reached him across a vast and sluggish ocean. Zephyr Gray, lady at arms at your service. Oh, they hanged dear Phineas. But they didn't hang the man who killed my son. Although in truth I hear he is no man at all. Puppet master, I've heard him called. I really don't care what manner of creature he is. Down in that caravan putting on his sick shows. What I do know is that he came into my home and took my beautiful Dylan, tore his body apart and imprisoned his soul in a monster's plaything of wood and string and left my husband to hang for it. I came back from a job earthside and found my husband dead and my son gone and I want them back. I want to hold them again, more than anything in the world. Absa felt a rough hand on his face, closing the eyes whose lids he could no longer move. Now go to sleep, Alderman Synth. Your money, the Lorimer's money, all of it is for my family. I was told it would take a king's ransom, and that's exactly what I have. I'm going to get them both back.
X is for X-ray, to see what is hidden. Y is for yell, but escape is forbidden. Teddy was disappointed. He'd been looking for the house of Teddy's, and had run into one distraction after another. It was fun to stop and play, but he really wanted to find the house of Teddy's that the little boy with the big knife had mentioned. There was something about being in a house that made Teddy's stitches tingle, and if it had yellow curtains, that would be even better. Yellow curtains and their family would be best of all. A couple of times he had seen, or thought he had seen, a small figure following him, but every time he turned it was gone. He was left with an impression of wooden limbs and strings and a pirate hat. It seemed familiar for a moment, but then he would find something new and wonderful and get all excited, and his head was fuzzy at the best of times. There had been the little girl in the blue dress. She and Teddy had played for a while. The little girl had found a daddy wandering all alone in the streets. Resolve Jones had spent an evening drowning his sorrows, and was full as a tick, staggering from pillar to post trying to find a street he recognized. A girl came from out of nowhere, took his hand and spoke to him. She looked normal in all respects but one. The wisps of smoke coming from her empty eye socket sobered him up, but quick. But by then, it was too late. And asked him if he wanted to play hide-and-seek. Teddy liked that game, and it quickly got underway. Resolve Jones screamed as the girl plucked his eyes out. In disbelief, he found he could still see through them, and watched himself clutching his own maimed face as the girl popped his eyes into her own vacant sockets. You should hide, she said, and started counting back from twenty. Jones ran and watched himself stagger away around the corner. With Teddy carrying the little girl in the blue dress and her telling him where to go. The daddy wasn't very good at hiding. But every time they found him crouched under a cart or in a doorway, he would leap up. He had no idea where he was and had tripped and fallen so many times his clothes were torn and wet with blood. But then he would see himself and know they had found him again, that girl and the monster she was riding on, and run off again. This game was fun! Outside a ruined post-house, Resolved Jones turned his ankle on a loose cobble and fell heavily, breaking through rotten wooden slats over a buried coal pit. His left leg and collarbone shattered when he hit the bottom. He tried to be quiet, but the pain came out in whimpers he could not stop. Then he saw a loose cobble and the broken slats of a pit, and knew they had found him again. The girl thing jumped down the pit, and he watched as she ate what was left of his face. The little girl in the blue dress skipped away into the night, and Teddy waved goodbye, Another chapter in his great adventure complete. In the ruins of the post house, a pair of painted eyes watched him go. Z is for Zephyr, bold, quick and brave, summoning monsters, her family to save. The inventors for hire who had built the device for Zephyr, Dr. Oldish, and his shrewish assistant, Mr. Lemon, had told her it would work best at some place high. So she carried it piece by piece to the top of the North Towers on Hurrycross Bridge. She was sweating freely on her third trip up the narrow winding steps. It had cost her every cent of guild scrip she had earned in the four months since her family had gone, and all their savings from before then. Dr. Aldish had raised the cost at the last minute, but she had been expecting that, and had negotiated a six-chambered discount that the good doctor had been wise enough to accept. She finished assembling the device at midnight, as the damp on the wind finally turned to rain, and lightning flashed far off across the city. The device was about the size of four large travelling trunks stacked together. Most of its innards were concealed behind polished wooden panels, but here and there copper coils or brass buttons broke the surface. On top, Complicated arrangements of glowing glass tubes reflected in gleaming black ceramic insulators. The raindrops hitting them sizzled into vapour. 
It looked expensive and impressive, but the real cost lay in the customized soul stones hidden within. Zephyr opened a wooden hatch on the front. Resonances, Dr. Oldish had said. Something etherically attuned to both you and the subjects. That meant personal belongings. And Zephyr placed her wedding ring, the one thing she'd refused to pawn, in one hatch, and a lock of her boy's hair in the other. Times had been hard when Dylan was born, and she remembered repairing his favorite teddy bear stitches with some of his own hair to save on thread. The memory hardened inside her like all the others. She flipped the switches in the sequence Mr. Lemon had written down for her, and waited in the rain. The noose tugged, but this was stronger by far. Phineas Gray turned and floated across the river. The rope around his neck dangled down, drawing a wake in the black water below his feet. She did not have long to wait. The air grew cold, and puddles iced over as her dead husband's lolling head rose over the tower parapet. He drifted up and over, toward the device, the wet rope around his neck trailing on the stones. Fear froze her, but only for a moment. It was working, just as they said it would. Phineas, she called. Phineas, it is me. He turned toward her, and for a moment she thought she saw something alive in his dead white eyes. But then the whispering began and he drifted over the rooftop toward her, ice crackling into being beneath him. Before the whispers grew too loud, she flipped the first master switch and the device hummed anew. A blue light from a coiled tube pierced her husband through the breast, and he floated in silence. All strings led to the puppet master, but this string was new, new and taut like iron on a cold day. The other strings snapped one by one, and Dylan Gray ran over the cobbles on wooden pegs, heading for the bridge. She had only just flipped the switch when Zephyr's instincts told her to duck. As she did so, a small bundle of black cloth and sticks hurtled over her head to land skittering and struggling to stand on the spreading ice. Painted eyes glared at her with a malevolence that chilled her soul, even as carved fingers, black with dried blood, reached out for her. Dylan, she cried one hand on the second master switch. Her mind rebelled at the thought that this murderous marionette could be her only son. It found its footing and advanced on her, but still she did not flip the switch. Dylan, she begged, looking for anything that might remind her of her child. It's Mama. The grasping hands were only inches from her face when she flipped the master switch. The puppet stopped held up by a single thread of blue light from Dr. Oldish's device. Dylan, she whispered, raising a hand to the marionette's painted face. It twitched once, then nothing. She gathered her resolve and began the final sequence of the device. His stitches tingled as they never had before. Something powerful was tugging at them and not even the black nightmare thread the widow had placed within him could resist. Teddy reached the tower and started to climb. The device was rumbling and hissing like an old boiler, and shafts of blue light lanced out into the rain-lashed night to rival the approaching lightning. Zephyr stood back, her heart in her throat, willing the device to work, looking from it to her husband and son and back again. She shouted at the machine, cajoling and begging it to complete its task. But she knew it was out of her hands now. Thunder rumbled as sparks flew, and she looked in astonishment as the noose around her husband's neck glowed blue, loosened, and slid to the stones. The puppet's wooden limbs split, and layers of wood began to peel back. She had not dared to hope, not once, not since she had found her home cold and empty and her family gone all those long months ago. But now she did. She did not notice the monstrous creature heave itself over the tower parapet behind her. Teddy had once had button eyes, and those eyes had seen things. Images flashed before him. A house with yellow curtains and toys on the floor. A man, a woman, and a child. 
a family, not just any family, but his family. Something bad had happened to them, but here they were, gathered on top of this tower to greet him. They were all together again. Teddy was overjoyed, and he noticed the hissing, chugging device beyond the mummy. They had brought a toy to play with. He knew what he had to do. He had to take his family back to the house with the yellow curtains. Everything would be fine then. Teddy smiled. He would show them what a good Teddy he was. He would carry the toy for them. Zephyr was sent sprawling across the rooftop as the monster barged past her. Her anguished cry was lost in a peal of thunder. It all happened so slowly. The creature reached out two enormous claws, each ragged talon black as night, and plunged them deep into the device. Wood splintered. A pressurized container burst, and scraps of brass flew through the air. Sparks leapt from raindrop to raindrop as the blue light spluttered and died. The hulking creature, its filthy fur matted in the rain, turned toward her. The innards of the machine cradled in its claws. Eyes like stab wounds looked at her, and it bared row after row of vicious fangs. Zephyr screamed in disbelief and drew her sword and pistol. Something had gone wrong, Teddy knew. The mummy was angry, angrier than he had ever seen her. Zephyr emptied her pistol into the huge head, each shot ripping tears in the sodden, patchy fur. Something black boiled beneath, dark and fearful. She leapt forward, slashing with her sword, but the nightmare thing raised its claws and blocked her blade. Then the thunder and her own cries faded away and she could hear only the hiss of the rain on the stones. There was a voice carried on the rain, a voice she knew well, and it spoke only one word. Justice. 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 She turned aghast. The thing that had been her husband was at her side, the stench of death overwhelming her, and knives of ice drove into her mind. She tried to push him back, and then the marionette was on her, clinging to her back and stabbing at her eyes with its sharp little fingers. Teddy could not understand what he had done wrong, but now his whole family was angry. He had to do something. Protecting her face with her pistol hand, Zephyr grabbed the puppet and hurled it into the undead body of her husband, knocking them both back. She staggered back a step, reeling from the wounds to her head and back and the unrelenting whispers that poisoned her mind. She fell to her knees. Teddy reached out to help the mummy stand. He lifted her to her feet and then realized he had made an awful, clumsy mistake. Zephyr gaped wordlessly, gripping the black talons where they pierced her belly. The razor edges of the claws sliced her hands open to the bone, and her body shook as one talon grated against her spine. The creature stared at her, smiling as blood welled in her mouth. She looked over at her son and husband as her vision darkened. The riven wood of the puppet's limbs was smoothing over once again as the effects of the device faded. Her husband bent awkwardly and picked up the fallen noose. He tightened it around his broken neck with cold, dead fingers. Then the black talon slid out of her stomach, soaring against her bones and she collapsed to her knees. With a Herculean effort, she rose to her feet and took a step toward her family. But she had finally pushed her body to its limits. And she fell one last time. She could not move, but the rain felt cool on her face. The last thing she saw was three abominations gathering around her under a storm-bruised sky. The mummy was sleeping on a red, red rug, and the daddy and the boy stood over her. Teddy looked at the daddy's white, lifeless eyes and grey, sagging skin. He looked at the boy's cruel, painted face and blood-stained hands. This was not what he remembered. Not at all. The noose tugged. And the thing that would never again be Phineas Grey felt the fires of vengeance kindle once more. 
a corpse, a nightmare, and a wooden doll that no longer sparked any memories in his rotten skull. There was nothing here to listen to the truths he must tell. The hanged man drifted away. The strings returned, one by one, and the puppet that only looked like Dylan Gray felt them pulling him back to the gaily painted caravan on the waste ground. The lumbering creature took a step toward him. The puppet had been following it for a long time, whenever the strings had allowed him. It had reminded him of a toy he'd once loved, but this blood-stained monster was nothing like the teddy bear whose memory was fading fast. The marionette skittered off over the cobbles, returning to his true master. Teddy ran after him, but he was too slow, and a moment later he was alone on top of the tower. He stood trembling, his claws clenched. His stitches ached as if they were being pulled out one by one. It had all been a lie. The house, the yellow curtains, the family, all of it was a lie. He swung both great arms at the wreckage of the device, sending fresh splinters of wood and brass out into the storm. He would never play with toys ever again. No one would. With a sky-splitting roar, he brought fists like hammers down onto the gutted remains again and again, smashing it to pieces. He would never be friends with anyone ever again. He ripped stones and tiles from the roof and hurled them into the night great inky streaks of black ooze running from his bullet hole eyes. He hated them all, every one. Then he heaved a buckled frame over the parapet. Lightning flashed overhead. A fissure of light touched the soaring frame, and Teddy gaped in wonder. A thousand sparks burst into life in brilliant hues, crackling and fizzing in a kaleidoscope of stars. Fireworks! Beautiful fireworks! It was the most magical thing he had ever seen. He spread his arms as the incandescent motes drifted around him, twirling and swirling like fairies in the night. It seemed to go on forever, as if the stars above had come down to dance just for him, and he danced along with them, turning and whirling across the rooftop. Where the stars touched him they tickled, and he laughed, spinning and swaying all the more. When it was over, and the last of the twinkling fairies had gone, he walked to the parapet and looked out over the city. The rain eased and stopped. The storm passed and faded from memory. Teddy smiled as he thought of all the excitement and wonder that awaited him in his magic kingdom. This truly was the greatest of adventures. Unfortunately, I have been handed an emergency press release relating to the activities I mentioned in the middle of our program. I am now to advise you all to avoid both the hanging tree and the mysterious brightly painted caravan. The hanging tree has been cordoned off to the public for the foreseeable future, due to a missing body. Belonging in life to a Mr. Phineas Gray, the body was removed from the tree where he was hung. The guild are currently treating the disappearance as suspicious and are combing the area for clues. As for the painted caravan, it has come to our attention that its occupant literally traps the souls of young children inside wooden puppets for eternity, so it would be wise to give that one a miss. Coming up next, an advertisement for Miss W. Weaver's Bear Building Workshop. As ever, be careful with those needles. You could take someone's eye out with those things. Stay safe out there, listeners, because bad things happen.